Good morning, everyone. So, <laughs> so the, the second talk I gave was about weighing standards and guidelines, but also clinical practice guidelines. And in fact, this, this presentation should be called Weighing Clinical Practice Guidelines because, um, yeah, that's what it's going to be about. I still am a respiratory therapy student. Uh, and I, I was a co-author of the 2009 uh, European Guidelines on Cardiopulmonary Bypass, uh, and I'm going to talk about how we, how, we did, how we did that and what our problems were. So I'm going to talk about standards, what guidelines and what they are, clinical practice guidelines, how they are made, some examples, what biases and in how we can uh, achieve this in the future, how we can uh, make better guidelines. So standards are uh, things that, that like uh, anything that you do and you should, you shall meet uh, the requirements in order to, to do good pulmonary, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, something that you shall meet. Uh, and, a, and a guideline is something, is a, a recommendation that you can consider uh, to do and, and can assist you in the development and implementation of protocols. And these are based on the available clinical evidence, but also on currently accepted perfusion practices. It means that, um, so also involved in, in the development in the ICBP, so in the development of these standards and guidelines for AMSECT. And what we continuously try to do is find a balance between the ideal world like that that should all be that we all should work in a center like in Pennsylvania where uh, we have a perfusion timeout and we have uh, uh, that we can go to the surgeon and say this is what we what you need to do for the patient like the ideal world and what is achievable in 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 uh, in perfusion and not getting people into trouble by us saying well this is something you should meet but we know it's impossible but you still have to try so that's that's a fine, uh, uh, fine balance. And clinical practice guidelines are, are also recommendations, but they are systematically develop, developed. So they, they follow a rigorous path uh, to, to look at literature, what is available, and based on that literature and not on what you want the literature to say, you uh, make statements about clinical practice. Well, that's just, just what I said. It's a rigorous and long process. I'm not going to go over all these uh, uh, different subjects, but there's a lot of discussion, a lot of reading, a lot of reviews, a lot of uh, resubmitting of reviews. And then we did in our standards and guide in our clinical practice guidelines, excuse me, we did four reviews and the first uh, review document was by seven different reviewers and it was a 75 page word document and it was really, really painful. So what can go wrong? Well, we're all busy, we're all busy clinical. Well, uh, not me anymore for the moment, but we also, we all have clinical schedules, non-clinical schedules, and we, we all set ourselves deadlines. I, I cannot work without a deadline. Um, we all have we all have our own uniform way of searching literature and grading the scientific lit, uh, literature like the europeans have their way it's it's basically the same but it's not always the same uh there's a lot of uh, topics that we like that we do that that lack scientific evidence like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute is probably not a good idea but there's no randomized clinical trial that can prove that it's unsafe. In fact, there's more case reports of people surviving, uh, uh, jumping out of a par uh, an airplane without a parachute, than that there are uh, case reports of people dying. So, and then because of that lack of scientific evidence, you have to do a lot of consensus. And consensus is the same as bias, because I can say, well, I think we should measure the pre-oxygenator pressure so we can see when there's a when there's a, a, a pressure gradient uh, problem, uh, but if if the surgeon doesn't care about what's happening to my oxygenator, then he will probably not support that. 
So you always have to find recommendations that are acceptable for everyone. Uh, and you have some some uh, limitations by the journals and the societies. For example, when we did the, when you write uh, recommendations, you can only use a certain amount of words and you can only use a certain amount of reference per uh, recommendation. And you have to constantly, constantly uh, balance that. And then I talked about the peer review and bias. So that's bias is just in a, inherent to the development of guidelines. Like we are all humans, and we still um, uh, we we still have our own opinion about how something should be done. And this is how we we are searching for evidence. The the ladies that are blindfolded are searching for the evidence that are, that is us. And then the evidence is walking around and. We're yeah, it's very and there, there's consensus formation. So two heads bumping into each other is like consensus. That is how uh, how how the development of guidelines basically happens. And so, what can go wrong? Well, a lot of things can go wrong. And this is a, a, a nursing uh, document, a nursing publication. So it's evidence-based nursing users guide, and they follow they looked at the literature and followed this rigorous process. And what they found was that, um, that we as clinicians and, 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 and also managers, like if we have to go to our uh, administration, we, we, there's more and more guidelines, but they are all, if they are all coming to different conclusions, then we have to pick out the one that suits us best, which is also not good for the, for the, for the patients. And there's a lot of concerns about the quality of guidelines, especially since we have not much evidence. And sometimes following guidelines can do harm to patients, which is quite the opposite of what we want to achieve. Okay. So for example, uh, I looked at the, the literature in uh, patient blood management. Like these are all guidelines or clinical consensus documents that were uh, published in the last almost 20 years. Um, there's some on pediatrics, there's, we have the Europeans, we have the US, they should basically come to the same conclusion because they all fish in the same pond of, uh, of clinical, of uh, scientific literature. But still we find uh, differences and I'm going to focus on, on, on these uh, guidelines. So 2017 Pagano were the patient blood management guidelines. There were no perfusionists involved in the development of those. Then in 2018 we had the STS, SCA, and MSECT uh, clinical practice guidelines on anticoagulation. Then in 2019, we did uh, the cardiopulmonary bypass guidelines, and some of the some of the guidelines were also uh, based upon the 2017. Uh, at least the questions were based on the 2017 uh, guidelines. Uh, and then in in 2021, we had the TB uh, publication, which was again as STS, SCA, MSECT, but also the uh, Society for Advancement of Blood Management. Is that how it is? Uh, so the uh, more and more collaboration, which is good. But then uh, there's a difference in, in methodology. Uh, for example, the Europeans don't really describe how they look for uh, literature, which questions were used, which uh, queries were used, the search strings. Well, in the, the American guidelines on, on uh, PBM were very extensively described. Like you can, you can literally uh, copy paste almost the search string and put it in a search, search machine and, and look at the literature again. Uh, the grading method is also highly, more highly developed in, in, uh, in the American guidelines. Uh, and, and it shows in the classification scale. Uh, I'm not going to go too much, uh, too deep into it. And also, and then in contrast to that, uh, the conflict of interest, like I work for this company or I work for this company or I receive uh, presentation fees from this company. They were only mentioned in the American guidelines, but very, very uh, extensively described in detail in the European guidelines. But then let's let's look at some examples. Uh, for, for example, the preoperative identif identification of high-risk patients. Uh, 
uh, we said, yeah, you should do that. You should really look at your patient, but we didn't give a recommendation. While TB and all TB uh, gave this a high recommendation, something that you really should do with a level A of evidence. That means that there's enough evidence to prove there's some randomized clinical trials that prove that uh, you should do this. Treating anemia preoperatively, everybody agrees that you shouldn't give uh, red blood cells before the operation, uh, that, you that you should do other things. Uh, and we all agree, uh, uh, um, a level of class uh, a grading and classification three means that you shouldn't do something. Uh, retrograde and uh, wrapping is something you can use. Uh, and modified ultrafiltration is also something that you can use, but it's not really proven. So we, we, we think it might be beneficial, but it's not sure. So there's, in in in, in these are just some examples. There's consensus on on both sides of the pond about what or what you shouldn't or what not you should do. But then, for example, um, let's take a deeper look. Uh, so in 2017, the PBM guidelines by Pagano, uh, they said like you should wrap, it should be considered as part of a blood cons conservation strategy to reduce transfusions. And they, they mentioned three uh, references. Uh, and you, if you're like interested in that, you go look in and what the references are and how they made it. Uh, but this is what they base their uh, recommendation on. And then TB et al, in, in four years later, they said, yeah, you should use it wherever you can, whenever it's possible, whenever the po patient tolerates it, you should do it. So basically the same, a uh, little bit stronger recommendation. And they use a, a new, uh, a reference which wasn't published in when when 2017 guidelines came out they used uh, Sakowski which is the same reference but Van der Wiele has disappeared although this was a very strong uh, evidence we thought and there's evidence from 2015 which might not have been in the search string or uh, in the search uh, results in the 2017 because you there's the first thing you do you you start searching and, and the pro whole process can take up to a year and a half or, or two years. So maybe or maybe not, uh, this article could have been used to, to uh, produce this uh, recommendation. So already a little bit debatable, but then in 2019, when we did the CPB guidelines, we had a highly uh, strong recommendation and we used two of the recommendations that were already there and then we, put in a third one, which is not mentioned here. And that's one because of um, the fact that we can only put three references there. So you have to choose, which is, in my humble opinion, not the correct way. But And then also, this evidence was already available in 2017. So why is it not mentioned here? And that's probably because we, we all think that we all look at a, an article in a different way and, and, and we're going to produce different recommendations from a different, uh, from a different perspective. So just to, if you're looking at guidelines, uh, it's, it's not the a holy script. So you always have to interpret them with, with caution and, and critique. Uh, and then something, another example is a protein uh, guideline. Um, the Pagano guideline said you should do it in a ratio, the, the reversals should be done in a ratio less than one to one. Uh, and then in 2018, the coagulation guidelines, they said it should be in less than uh, one to 2.6, which is like, I would almost say criminal. And I know where this uh, thing comes from, but I hope they change it uh, soon. And then bias, this is a really nice, uh, um, diagram of all the kinds of bias that exist uh, in in life like it's 188 kinds of bias uh, over over different categories but it's it's just like the way you look at someone can can or you're discussing guidelines and someone looks at you and you think uh, they, they are looking at me in a funny way 
I'm, I'm not going to accept how he looks at how he or she looks at me, and I'm going to oppose this guideline. It just can be very, very uh, stupid. Something, something stupid like that. So we cannot make guidelines without bias. We just have to be. We just have to uh, not try to ignore it, but try to accept that we are uh, all uh, uh, having bias. And that we, when we make a decision, we have to say, is this a decision that I want? Or is this a decision that is good for the patient? Or that is uh, consistent with what the literature tells us? I might think that, uh, that measuring the, the pre-oxygenator pressure is, is a good thing. But if there's no evidence that, that is beneficial for the patient, if you don't find any, um, if you keep measuring it and there's no adverse events, that you can detect by only measuring changing that, then I have to accept that there's no use in doing it. And that's maybe it's just because I think it's cool. So that's that's the way you, well, I try to uh, avoid bias. What's the future? Well, the, uh, we should be more international, I think. There shouldn't be any more EU or US guidelines. There should be global guidelines. Uh, this will work for not work for standards and guidelines because in standards and guidelines there's a lot of local uh, uh, things like, uh, for example, uh, you should be in the in the in the in the OR within 30 minutes, or uh, we can say it's within 30 minutes because everybody lives close to the hospital in in certain countries, but in other countries people live like far away and and they need an hour to get to the hospital. And it's just something that you have to deal with. So that will be harder. But for clinical practice guidelines, which are based on the literature that is globally available, that, that should be doable. And we can do this. And that is one of the, the, the better aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic is that there's an incredible, um, first of all, global collaboration, but also they developed techniques to, to be able to uh, catch all the literature that is available about something. At a certain point around March 2021, every three minutes, there was an article that was published that talked about COVID-19. So you, you just cannot find what you need in that pool of, uh, of literature. And so they developed, uh, with, the, with the help of AI and machine learning, or just the, the strength of computers, they developed uh, ways to, to look at literature so they use computing power. And so instead of you know, creating guidelines, which takes two years, and then make clinical decision support, that means you have to publish it, you have to distribute it, you have to read it, and then you have to uh, put it into clinical practice. And it finally uh, goes to patient care. That can take up to 13 to 17 years. So that, that's just not acceptable. And then you have to, from the outcomes of the patient care, you have to go back to new clinical guidelines. So that is really long and, and cumbersome project. With the help of computers, we can, we can uh, develop these guidelines, but continuously adapt them with the results from registries that use these guidelines to, to develop patient care. And it's a consistent feedback loop, like the, the diagram I showed you earlier. With all the, with everything connected with each other, that that gives constant feedback loop to to the machines that say like, well, yesterday you had to give blood when it when the patient had a hematocrit of seven and point five, today it's eight because there's new evidence, so it can go really fast. Uh, there are some, uh, there is some new software developed that you you put in a question like. Uh, in adult, adult patients on cardiopulmonary bypass, do, should I use cell saving or not to reduce blood transfusions? And then the, the literature will be searched. They will tell you, the, the computer can tell you immediately uh, based on some uh, criteria, if this is a, uh, a well-developed, if it's a review, if it's an RCT, and then you can uh, log in and there's always a human factor, of course, um, that says like, uh, so two people log in and, and, and look at what the, the literature is and if it's something that should be considered in the, 
in the evidence uh, in the uh, sorry recommendation uh, uh, formation if it's uh, an article that should be included and so it it can search for certain uh, keywords or certain uh, uh, like so the yellow for example is the kind of patient that it is the patient population uh, in 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 orange we see that it's a randomized controlled trial um, and then in purple it's the intervention this is like a prophylactic dose of anox anoxoparin in a certain uh, in a certain group of patients that undergo a certain procedure and that's how computers can help us to develop guidelines uh, i talked about this uh, so the future will be clinical decision support. There's already some of that is already working. For example, this is a, a group of hospitals that uh, implemented the guidelines into their EMR. And whenever someone uh, wants to wants to order a, a blood product, it will say, oh, oh, sorry, the last hemoglobin of this patient was 12.3. 12, so it immediately tells you, well, you shouldn't give blood to this patient because there's nothing wrong. Well, and then, you, then you can give a reason. Uh, you can say, well, since the last hemoglobin, I checked it with a with a eye stat, and it's now eight, and the patient is bleeding. Uh, there's ischemia. There's an active bleeding. The surgeon is on his knees crying for help. So stuff like that, and and then you can justify giving blood. But it's monitored, and it's it's not like a big brother monitoring, but it's like. We want to know why people give blood to a patient. And then it not only led to uh, less blood donation, and, and we saw yesterday that that gives a whole uh, cascade of, of, uh, of, of blood saving, not only blood saving, but also patient saving uh, um, practice, but it also is very cost saving. So if you want to... Um, and I'm not going to go deeper into details, but if you want to convince your administration to do something like that, like clinical decision support, you should use this. We should also know that there's bias in artificial intelligence. Like if we are going to ask a computer to look at the literature and want to know what we are doing, that computer is going to take into consideration the, the bias that is published in the literature. So, and for example, this is... Uh, this is an, an, an algorithm that is used for commercial uh, thing to for reimbursement. So I don't know much about the reimbursement uh, system in, in, in the United States, but what it what it uh, what the algorithm decided, and this is people, this is actual people with actual money and actual diseases. They said that the black patients, the black population of patients, spend less money in on healthcare. So that means that they are less sick, so they need less reimbursement, or they need a, I don't know what, but it, it's it's an example of how bias can can produce inequity in in healthcare. We need to constantly monitor that when we are uh, using this artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. So my second set of conclusions: so guidelines are a useful and necessary tool, I think. But you always use, have to use your critical mind. We should adapt the development and implementation process with computers, uh, automatic feedback to devices and clinicians, and should be reproducible with uh, AI. And we should educate people uh, in the development and, and use of it. And this was uh, given on Happy on uh, Halloween, uh, so I, it just come, pops up now. This is a a costume for an ECMO specialist. And I would like to thank you. And if you want to read some more literature, I take this opportunity to uh, selfishly uh, make some <laughs> advertising. Thank you very much.